I am like, my reaction to Gavin Newsom is like in a 90s thriller movie where there's a good looking blind chick and the killer shows up to take her out on a date and the dog is looking, is growling at the yeah, guy and yeah. you go, Rex, what's wrong, Rex? Come on. Like the dog knows yeah. something, you know? Gavin Newsom makes my skin crawl. Yes. And, and Kamala Harris makes my skin crawl too, not as badly. Nancy Pelosi makes my skin crawl. And then there's people, you know, on the right and on the left that are like, there's people on the left that are sort of normal and sort of, you go, all right, I disagree with, I don't know, Ted Lieu, but I don't, it doesn't make my skin crawl. You know what I mean? What is it about Gavin Newsom where I go, this guy's a sociopathic, f cheating, lying piece of shit. And my mom goes, I'm voting for him. And I'm God, like, why oh, don't you God. why don't you experience him like I experience him? That's wow. the question. Why are you and I it transcends right and left. It's right. just I experience him. I don't experience Karen Bass, who's you know, could be every bit as bad, mayor of Los Angeles, whatever is Gavin Newsom. My skin doesn't crawl. What is it with him and how come others don't experience that? Almost 14 hours since I've seen Dave Rubin. Had a lovely dinner with him and others. We'll get into that. The Rubin Report is the name of the YouTube show. Dave does such a great job. Always great to see you, my friend. Corolla, it's good to see you. And I just want to reiterate, <clears throat> uh, before we get into anything else, what I just said to you off air, which is that if I take you for dinner, mm. order your own potato. Mm. You, you shared the potato with a billionaire. You were sitting next to a billionaire you didn't have to pay, and you you split a potato with nothing on it, like a pauper. How do you think I became a? Oh no, he's a billionaire. <laughs> he's the billionaire. I'm he broke. Oh god damn it! I felt so good about that one when it was coming out, but then I lost momentum. Yeah, I split yes. a eighty-nine cent potato yes. with a billionaire, and with nothing on it. You could have had everything on it. You could have had your we, own. You could have had the third cocktail too. We had to negotiate a little bit. We had to talk. He didn't want the cheese and the bacon <laughs> bits, and I respect that. So, oh wait, you wanted everything on it. He didn't want anything. No, that... no. I we discussed it because yeah. when you whack up a spud with a bill. Billionaire, yeah, you got to get something on paper. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, you could get screwed. You know what I mean? It's like when Taylor Swift marries uh, Kelsey uh, the Travis or whatever yeah. Travis Kelsey or whatever. Yeah. Th there's going to be a prenup. Oh. And when you whack up a potato with a billionaire, you have to have a discussion. His people talk to my people. We agreed that cheddar cheese was a fool's errand and chives. And then we said we both like butter. He nodded. I nodded. We understood it. And so we whacked up the potato. So you split a buttered potato with billionaire David Sachs from the All In Podcast. And he was the original C. COO of PayPal, and actually, yes. he is a great segue into a, a Mark McGrath Sugar Good. Ray story that I wanted to tell you after listening to the guys from Smash Mouth just now. So Sachs had, uh, I think it was his 49th birthday here in L.A. about five years ago when I still lived here. The potato and splitter? The potato splitter, David mm -hmm. Sachs. It was his birthday. And he had a birthday party at his house, and he had Mark McGrath MC the party and Coolio was there and a couple other singers were there and Mark McGrath, you know, it's a couple hundred people. And it's, you know, to some extent, it's a little sort of depressing, like he's emceeing the party. It's like cool, but also like, this is what you've got now. You're emceeing this thing. And anyway, but he was great. He was absolutely great. And he didn't phone it in and he was funny and he was kind of self-deprecating throughout it and everything else. And we had a great, 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 great night. Yeah. And now when you go to a party for a billionaire, what, what do you get a billionaire? You, you have some rich friends. three quarters of a potato, <laughs> seven eighths of a potato. I'm more than half, if that's what you're Oh, so now I on. see what was happening. You've been to previous parties with him and you were trying to make it up with a potato. potato. Yeah. Okay, so we go to the party and I'm like, I don't know what I can get this guy. Like, what can you possibly get someone that quite literally has everything physical that they yeah, want? Yeah, there's not, you got to get them something they could re-gift to somebody else when they go to That's somewhere. literally all you can do. So we got him a nice bottle of champagne. It's completely yeah. ridiculous because, you know, yeah. whatever. And he's a great, great guy, and they've been unbelievably generous to us and, and helped us with a lot of things. I mentioned how they helped us when we moved to Los Florida. Angeles and Bob, or we moved to Florida. Miami. Yeah. Thank you. Anyway, so 31 the, days. Couple part, home. 30, basically, what happened was I was going to stay at his house in Miami for three days. Three days. But then everyone got COVID, so we couldn't close on our house for a month. And he let us literally stay at his house on the beach for a month. Like, we asked 31 last night. Yeah, yet. 31. It was pretty amazing. Yeah. Anyway, so five hours go by. It's a great part. Coolio sings. 
Sugar Ray sings. There are a couple mm -hmm. other disco people singing. Mm -hmm. They had water people in the pool, water dancing, doing uh -huh. all this stuff. Oh, Fire people. Yeah, yeah, all the stuff. Mm -hmm. Great party. And then, it, uh, then it's just the party. And Sugar Ray, Marky Mark's there. Marky Mark. Mark mm -hmm. McGrath is not Marky Mark. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Different I'm party. Following. And we go to the bar, and he's standing by the bar, and there's a gift table. And as I said, we brought champagne, but there's all these gifts. And someone brought a black Class Azul. Mm. The, you know, the Class Azul fancy tequila yeah. bottles. Mm -hmm. And it was like the Class Azul Ultra. I think it's usually around 8,000, 9,000, 10,000 really? bucks. Yeah. And it's sitting there. And it's a gift table where people drop off their yeah. gifts. Yeah. And it was basic, right. but it was basically all booze and it was right. right next to the bar. Right. So if you really weren't thinking or it was later and you've been drinking, right. you might think this is just all sure. the booze for the bar. So he literally, we're waiting for a drink. He takes the bottle and he's like, what is this? And I hadn't even said hello to him or anything. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, well, that that's seriously great. And I love tequila, as you know. And, and I was like, that is some seriously great tequila. I have no idea how much that costs. Like, that's a great bottle. I've never tried it. I'd love to one day. But I wasn't about to open the... He opens up the bottle. I, he fully did not realize it was the gift table. Right. He thought he was just at the bar. He, the bartender was distracted. He grabs a big glass, like I'm talking a glass tumbler. like you have here, like a tumbler. He puts ice about three quarters of the way and then fills the entire thing with it. And now it's filled. It's so about $1,000 like, worth. I was going to say like $1,400 yeah, worth of tequila. Yeah, probably about $1,400 worth, $1, worth of tequila. And he goes, he looks at me and he goes, you know, I don't really like tequila. Let me try this. He sips it and then he's like, nah. And then I drank the entire thing. Nice. I drank $1,400 of David Sachs tequila right out of my I ate half his potatoes. So ate, between the two so, of us, he's going to the poorhouse. <laughs> Yeah, that's, one day we could have a full meal. I'll drink a full drink. You'll eat a full meal. I just don't like wasting food, so I just felt like he he was good for half a tot, and I was good for half a tot. <laughs> We're sitting next to each other, and you know, I was, you know, it's called breaking bread, not separate loaves. It was breaking potato. You yeah. It. So it was uh, Dennis Prager was there last night. Larry yeah. Elder, you of course, um, Dennis's wife Sue, uh, Doctor Drew, Sage Steel. Uh, Michael Shermer. Yeah, a real good group. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and so God bless you for arranging this thing, because as I admitted to Dr. Drew, we love this stuff and enjoy it so much, but would never initiate it. Yeah. And that's the part that I'm missing in life. You know what I mean? I go, this is great. I love these people. This is awesome. But wouldn't implement it like wouldn't yeah. initiate it well you know? well first off well i'm really glad to hear you say that actually because i said when i when i toasted to the table last night uh that the only thing i miss about los angeles and me and you can do the why la sucks and california is going right. down the tubes all the time the only thing i miss is that i miss my friends mm -hmm. i miss the parties that you guys used to come over to either dinner parties or big parties i miss throwing the steaks on the grill for everybody and we did have a great community a lot of the people have left the people that we just mentioned that were there last night are basically it. You're you're within my last ten, and you're on your way out eventually too. But that that's pretty much my last ten that I have here to have a really just kind of fun, intellectual, ridiculous. You know, we all have these very bizarre public lives too in the midst of all of this crazy thing, and uh, and it was just a great night. And yeah, and you know, as Drew pointed out when I was talking to him earlier today, everyone was there asking questions, yeah. wanting to get everyone's opinion on stuff, like input. There was no one, you know, my way or the highway, or yeah. you know, this guy's a billionaire, so you better listen to him, or whatever. Everyone was kind of interested, especially you, and sort of going, oh, what's your take on this, Larry Elder or well, Dennis Prager? And also, we actually have a huge amount of political variety in that group. You know, Michael Shermer, who was there, he's from Skeptic.com, and he's still basically basically a lefty, at least Democrat publicly, something like that. Then you have Elder more on the libertarian Trump side of things. I, you and I are kind of simpatico on more of, let's say, like a libertarian classical liberal position, something like that, which in essence makes you vote Republican. That you have Dennis, who's obviously more of a traditional conservative. You have Drew, who is just waking up politically in light of all the COVID stuff. So not that it was all about politics, but it's cool to just sit with people that you respect and, and enjoy and then see all, and Sage is kind of similar too. She's a conservative, but you know, she was, she was just an ESPN anchor who didn't give a crap about politics until COVID, until they bashed her over the head with COVID and BLM and everything else. So you see all these people sit there and go back and forth and Sachs also, I mean, this was largely an apolitical guy until COVID and then really got into the, the Ukraine situation and shoot the shit 
and and pull and tug and try to figure out what everybody's thinking. And we laughed a lot and ate we potato. You, you, and you got to witness firsthand Dr. Drew destroying one of <laughs> Destroy. my stories. Which is, I, I listen. Incredible to me. The thing that's incredible about Dr. Drew is um, for years and years and years, I would sit next to Dr. Drew. Because now... Uh, I mean, we're we're creeping up. When I say creeping up, we're about a year away from thirty years of essentially broadcasting together. That's crazy, right? Crazy. And so, Drew would always do this. I'd go, so my girlfriend has a VW Square back that's white, right? And so she point she parks it in front of my apartment every night. So one night I go out there and I see a white VW square back. So I'm going to surprise her by putting my ass against the window. And Drew would go, and it was someone else's car, right? And I'll go, Drew, just, I'm telling a story. Can, can please, just let me finish. I'm setting it up. What do yeah. they say about the great comedy duos of all time? They, you know, they Hate each other's guts at some they point. They do kill each other mostly or suicide, murder, suicide, right. but they bring out the best in each I, other, right? So. George and Gracie, I right? What it. do these people do? But you, he literally was stealing your jokes <laughs> time after time, and you're eating half a potato. It was oh, depressing. God. And I said, so I would say to Drew all the time, I know your impulse is to like jump in and finish the story or jump to the end. Just, just hang back. I'm going somewhere. Like, I'm going somewhere with this. So, at some point, I don't know if it's him. I can't remember if it was you, but the other one goes, tell us the story about getting into radio. It's a great story. No, it was him. It he was told him. you to he tell the story, and up. then he ruined the story. He set me up. So, obviously, the story is Jimmy Kimmel, but Jimmy Kimmel went by Jimmy the Sports Guy, and he was going to fight Michael the Maintenance Man. And we had found a group of people at this table who were not familiar with the story. So I went, oh, all right, these are virgin ears, and I will take my time. <laughs> and... These are everyone at that table, I would say, is a master orator. These were uh, true communicators at that really table. You're really talking yeah. about yeah. a sort of world class Mount Rushmore. You know, you got Larry Elder and he's sitting next to Dennis Prager and Dave Rubin's at the end of the table. And you got some talkers and yeah. they're good at it. Yeah. So you kind of realize when you're telling stories to guys who tell stories <laughs> and are real good at it, yeah. that you'd like to kind of be on your game yeah. and make it entertaining. So I'm doing the part where and then Jimmy the sports guy and then Mike LeMain's man. And, and I keep saying Jimmy the sports guy intentionally because at the end. But I was not getting it. I was not getting it yet. People love it. Yeah. And I go, and this guy comes down the hall, and I, he says, Jimmy, the sports guy. And he says, are you the boxing trainer? And I go, yeah, and we're going to teach boxing. And that guy turned out to be Jimmy Kimmel. Except for that in Dr. Drew would not let that happen. Three minutes earlier, <laughs> oh, this is the story about Jimmy Kimmel. Uh, he goes, and I go, and then Jimmy the sports guy, and he goes, that guy was Jimmy Kimmel, tell him that. And, and, then, like, Drew. and then I just stop and yell at Drew in front of everybody at It the just table. left you with a broken story that you <laughs> half assedly have to- like I'm have done to, with my yeah. story. And then to watch you with the dry potato after that, too, uh, with your small like dry potato. I picked up potato. my potato, I ate it like an apple. <sighs> uh, so yeah, but, that was Dr. Drew. It is Dr. Drew. Yeah. I said Jimmy, Jimmy the sports guy five times, and at some point he just yelled across the table. <laughs> that was and I'm, the thing that's weird about Drew is I've said to him fifty five times, just don't do it. Don't do that. Just sit back. You don't have to do anything. Just don't jump in and don't jump to the end. Can't do it. All right, I'm gonna have a. I'm gonna have some kind of intervention with him on Please. television. He's he's famous for doing these sorts of things. That's I'm right. I'm gonna bring him. Aside. You're ruining his comedy career. It's too late. It's already ruined. By the way, did you note? Know, to me, the most interesting part of the evening was that when it devolved, as every conversation in Los Angeles does, into "My God, we all must leave. It's horrible here." Mm -hmm. That it. I literally. I said this, but it was true that I have not had that conversation in now two and a half years because I've been gone for two and Crazy. a half years. So it was really interesting for me to hear everybody being like, oh, the homelessness is still horrible and the drugs are still horrible and da 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 And then of course you have a you have the off ramp here because you are at least making some moves. I don't know if it's physical it's yet or just mentally or whatever, but but to hear that thing, you know, it's like to just hear that sort of crazy conversation over and over and then everyone explains why they can't move because they have this consideration or that consideration. I'm not diminishing any of that. 
But I just haven't been around that. Now when I'm having, and you'll come anytime next time you're in Miami and we do these parties, everyone's like, I'm here now and I'm loving it and things are great and this, and this is happening over here and the houses are going up everywhere and everything's amazing and the businesses are blowing up and we it's safe and you can't steal deodorant. And blah, blah. It's, it's funny that of all places when Newsom tries to pick on a red state, he goes with Florida, the one that everyone seems to appreciate love right. the most. Well, because he's, he's a soulless, evil, psychotic piece of shit. He is, but the question is, is why isn't that apparent to people? Like when I hear Kamala Harris speak or even Jill Biden, by the way, could you get, who's more annoying? By the way, in terms oh, of the mouthpiece, point, is Jill... Well, it seems to me that Jill's more annoying now because she's so directly in, tied into the evil thing that we all see happening, where Kamala, it's unclear how much she knows about what was going on with Biden or how important she's yeah, been in this game. But when where Jill's, Jill now, it's it's more obvious, like you were also, Palpatine. When she's like, Joe, you did so good. You're a big boy. You answered all the Everybody questions. Everybody loves you for what you did. Like, it's, so, <laughs> it's grating. I, I don't. All right, I'm confused about many things, but my yes. my thinking is is this. Um, so it's weird that people, as a human being, you're used to people sort of having the same or a general like minded um, perception of somebody. Mm -hmm. So, and I, well, let's just break it down because I've never really thought about this. But dudes, straight dudes, when a hot chick comes in a party, no, they don't go, oh, look at that five foot ten blonde with the D cups. <laughs> I personally think she's attractive. But, Bert, what about you? Yeah. You know, they go, look at that fuck. Out. Yeah, and yeah, then yeah. the other dude goes, she's smoking on. For the record, I can appreciate when yeah, hot chick yeah. walks in. Come just, on now. Let's not, yeah. All right. So, I, listen, I'll share a potato with you, man. I'm not a guy. <laughs> So the point is, is we have a kind of universal thing. And when a big, fat, scary person walks in, they go, Jesus Christ, look at that guy. And like if someone comes in with a really bad BO yeah. or bad plastic surgery yeah. or whatever, you just go, Jesus Christ, look at her. What a f***ing shit show. She paid for that shit. God damn, someone's got to tell her. And then you're, the person you're talking to always goes, oh, my God, I know. So then when Gavin Newsom comes into the ah, party. interesting. And then guys like you and me, I... Am like my reaction to Gavin Newsom is like in a '90s thriller movie where there's a good-looking blind chick and the killer shows up to take her out on a date and the dog is looking is growling at the yeah, guy and yeah. you go Rex, what's wrong, Rex? Come on, like the dog knows yeah. something, you know. Gavin Newsom makes my skin crawl. Yes, and and Kamala Harris makes my skin crawl too, not as badly. Nancy Pelosi makes my skin crawl. And then there's people, you know, on the right and on the left that are like, there's people on the left that are sort of normal and sort of, you go, all right, I disagree with, I don't know, Ted Lieu, but I don't, it doesn't make my skin crawl. You know what I mean? What is it about Gavin Newsom where I go, this guy's a sociopathic, f cheating, lying piece of shit. And my mom goes, I'm voting for him. And I'm God, like, oh, why don't you God. why don't you experience him like I experience him? That's wow. the question. Why are you and I it transcends right and left. It's right. just I experience him. I don't experience Karen Bass, who's you know, could be every bit as bad, mayor of Los Angeles, whatever is Gavin Newsom. My skin doesn't crawl. What is it with him, and how come others don't experience that? I will answer that question. Could we have your guys, while we do this, just Google Gavin Newsom lizard and, mm -hmm. and go to the first image. Can they just pull that up and see where the source came from on that? Mm -hmm. They can just go to Gavin Newsom lizard. Have seen that while picture. Are, you've seen that picture, but do you know the source image, the first thing that pops up? I've done this many times. I hope it works <laughs> since we're on the radio right now. Mark Gavin, McGrath, Sugar <laughs> Ray. Am I right? <laughs> I believe it will be if you search Gavin Newsom lizard. No, not a, on Twitter. Well, that's nice to see. It I was the first thing that showed up there, but just if you just Google image Gavin Newsom lizard, let's see what pops up and then I will answer Gavin Newsom, Lizard. Oh, I guess I'm number four there. 
Number I'm number four. four. All yeah. right. So that's pretty good. An image yeah. that I helped popularize, that evil face of yes. him on the lizard thing. So that's very exciting. Face stretched over a lizard head. So when people yeah. always say to me at the end of the show, what can you plug? It's like, can you just Google search Gavin Newsom lizard? You don't have to mm-hmm. send people to Rubin Report or any of that. Um, the reason for that, I think there's a couple of things. First off, you and I are in this game, right? We are in the game of politics. We're in the game of culture and everything else. We've been around the guy and people that have been around him. We survived COVID here. Everything that I talk about politically, he represents the antithesis of literally everything, how he deals with homelessness, how he deals with drug use, how he deals with housing prices, his his bloviation, the the fakeness of him, you know, the 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 slicked back American psycho, the hair, the the veneers, every single thing about him. You're right. It makes my skin crawl. I think he is genuinely, and I don't use I do talk in hyperbole a bit, but I but I I wouldn't say someone is evil if I didn't think they were evil. I think he is evil. What he did to this state, and it's not only what he did to the state, what he did to San Francisco as mayor, what he then did to this state, and he shows no remorse. If anything, he shows glee over it and thinks that he's right, and he would gladly do it again. And the fact that with that track record, he wants more power. And as it relates to everything going on with Biden right now, the fact that he showed up to the debate to tell everyone how wonderful Joe Biden is, it's like, it's so obvious what he's doing. He's making it clear to the machine, I am a good team player, and when you need it most, I will stab him in the back with my lizard tail that is tipped (laughs) with poison. But why is it attractive to so many Californians and why isn't it more transparent? Why are they unable to solve a very simple riddle of this guy looks like a cartoon character of a bad 80s politician? You know, Why it's, is it's that a little attractive bit, I think it's a people. little bit of the allegory of the cave. When you're in the cave, you don't know what's outside of the cave, and that's all you can see. And the thing, the, the thing of California is California, putting aside politics for a second, California should be and is, in all real purposes, an incredible state. The geography, the water, you can go skiing and go on the beach on the same exact day. Like the, what once was a great industry of Hollywood here, obviously it's not what, what it once was. You know, the idea that everyone in America came west to settle this place, to build something amazing, a place like Los Angeles that had no natural water and they made it happen and Palm Springs and all of the lore around all this stuff. So there, I think a lot of the people that still live here, they live in the dream that I think has largely turned into a nightmare. It's not to say it's all a nightmare. Obviously, if you live in the Hollywood Hills and you can have people deliver you Amazon things all day, you don't have to go to CBS and deal with all the theft and all of the rest of that stuff. But I would welcome anyone. When I moved here in 2013, I, we ended up in West Hollywood. We, mm-hmm. we, we, we just happened to find a place there. We could have been anywhere. We just happened to find a place that we liked there. And West Hollywood was booming. It was every new every day there was a new bar, a new restaurant. It was clean, it was vibrant, all of that stuff. When was the last time you were in West Hollywood? I mean, it is a never. It, it's a freaking nightmare. Everything is closed. Unless I haven't been there this trip, but I was here just a few months ago. Everything, the entire strip, which was once like the hottest strip. On Santa Monica, Boys Town. Santa Monica. Yeah, basically yeah. from La Cienega and Santa Monica to to Beverly Hills sign, like right. something like that. Mm-hmm. And everything is pretty much closed. And there's just kind of transients and drug addicts and people that are all, everyone looks kind of shady and the rest of it. But for but for some reason, the dream of California looms large in people's minds. But I guess you'd have to ask your mom what the real answer to that is. My mom would always vote Democrat and didn't really matter who it was. And I, for her, it was like a moral decision. It was like, yeah, the economy or the homeless or the border, or the education or whatever. But these are good people and we need the good people, which is basically sort of the pitch. It's sort of Biden's going, look, you know, maybe not a great record, not much to run on, but listen, I'm not evil and I love black people. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I, I love, did I mention I love black people? Yeah. And so here we are. So what do you want? You want the person who hates black people or the one who loves black people? And I'm like, I'd like the one who does the most for black people. I don't even it, want the one that does the most for black people. I would, oh, like, everyone, the one, I would right. like the one who doesn't even have to do everything, do anything for anyone. How about the one that gets out of our way, but does the basic duties of government which would be at least protect the border and make sure right. that, say, I don't know, that the rel- that the world 
kind of fears us a little bit. A little bit. How about not much more than that? Well, so for you, you bring up my mom, and then there's your mom. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny how I think if you're conservative and one of your kids goes off to Berkeley and becomes liberal, you kind of roll your eyes a little bit, be like, eh, maybe they'll grow out of it or right. whatever. You that's, just put a pause on the will for those years. That's all you do. In yeah, that that, yeah, that's what those kids, uh, the, what are they going to, how else is this going to work? You, you tolerate it. Um, the other way around, it's not really tolerated. You, no. you stop, you know, Hollywood, I mean, you stop getting var- invited to parties. You're not, I, you know, I was right about all things COVID, but I was punished for all things COVID and I'm not invited to the parties anymore. Yeah. So it is weird when your own family does it. And my family's pretty progressive and they didn't, I didn't really get shunned, but didn't really agree with anything I ever said. They don't keep a batting average of what you're right about, what you're wrong about. They just don't like what you're saying, you know? Yes, and you don't get the, oh, maybe you were right about some of that stuff. I haven't gotten a lot. But um, with you, your your family was more involved with you and, you know, connected. And I think your politics was a bigger wedge. And a lot of people would have said, well, you said last night coming out to them was no big whoop. It wasn't. It wasn't a huge cataclysmic thing. It's tough for everybody. But this to was extent. a bigger. But but this yeah, was bigger. What I was saying last night was that the, my political evolution, let's say, or sharing my political thoughts, really. I mean, there were a couple. Trump and COVID. Right. Supporting Trump the second time around, I didn't support right. him the first time, and then and then my position on COVID, which basically was after 15 days to slow the spread on day 16, I was done. That was right. my position, and and clearly guys like us largely were right just by being skeptical. I'm not a doctor, but I was skeptical, and through that skepticism, most of it turned out to be pretty damn true. And I'm thrilled that I didn't get vaxxed, and that none of my guys that worked for me got vaxxed, or that I was psychotic enough to encourage them to get vaxxed as if I'm their doctor or anything else. But my parents and and a lot of my family uh, were more on the other side of that thing. And I think as now it's kind of, as the worm has turned on this, where it has now become more obvious that social distancing was made up and masks never worked and the vaccine wasn't a vaccine and seeing delayed speech with kids and all the things that we could do for five hours, coupled with uh, not necessarily coming around on Trump, but coupled with this new situation on Biden that is just absolutely undeniable, undeniable. I am seeing a little crack, a little crack that maybe they'll be either voting a little bit differently or coming around one way or another. But you know what it's like. It's like they can always, they always ramp up the fear when they need to. It'll be the day before the election. All these people will be like, I am going to vote for Trump. I'm not going to make a big deal about it. And then suddenly they'll do some other thing. It turns out he was Hitler, you know. I think, I to me, the metaphor, maybe tell me if this rings true for you or, or, or what have you. A lot of those people got humbled. They got humbled by the dribs and drabs of articles coming out that maybe the shutting schools down hurt kids and maybe it hurt the inner city kids, what was more impactful to those kids and that the, yeah. uh, the vaccine wasn't as effective and could have been dangerous and unnecessary for many. And as it turns out, you know, vitamin D and sunshine and exercise would have been the best. And uh, here's the, here's the morbidity rate for people with no comorbidities. And it's 99.9996. I like, as the stuff trickled out. Yeah. Now, so for me, I was no scientist and I was not on the internet scrubbing data. I had about three people say to me very early on, and and I, I so I'm a, I study patterns, and I the pattern I was that would broke for me is I wasn't getting the ages of COVID deaths. They would mm-hmm. just say, man died in our lead of COVID. And I was like, now what age? And I never got it. And then I realized they were holding that back because he was 95 years old. So the first thing was that I kept talking to people who went, I did everything right and I still got COVID. I washed my hands, I wore my mask, I did the social distancing, I stayed in, I did everything, I got COVID. And then I'd talk to somebody else and i go, I did everything they told me to do and I got COVID. And yeah. then I went, all right, well then fuck it. Now, I'm not saying I want COVID. I'm saying I figured out very early on there's nothing you can do to avoid COVID, so I'm going to live my life. So yeah. it wasn't it wasn't a deep psychological discussion. It was like a quick math thing. You did everything, you got nothing. You did everything, you yeah. got nothing. So I'm going to do nothing and enjoy myself, and then I'll probably get it too. So there was that. 
But what's gone on, the metaphor I would say is like the the Democrats have been were like on the bench watching the baseball game of life and they're watching Trump pitch. And every single ball, they're going, oh, that was a ball. And they go, that was pretty, it looked like a strike. That was in the dirt. You know, they're sitting there yeah. and they kept going. If we could get our guy on that mound, I would embarrass you. I would show you what a real pitcher looks like. You know, we would bring the, the adults back to the mound, transparency and dignity, yeah. you know, back to the mound, you know. And at some point, Trump got off the mound and the guy they were talking about, it was a Cy Young Award winning, the best pitcher ever, took the mound. And he's throwing the ball over the backstop, and he's facing center field. Yeah, and he doesn't, Cy Young of he doesn't know where he is. Years old, yeah. And now we're looking to the guys that were razzing Trump the entire time, and they're silent. Yeah. They have nothing to say because their guy's a shit show. And that's why the people that were super loud a few years ago are sort of humbled and quiet now. Oh, I think that's a perfect analogy. And that's that's why everything is so weird right now. Look, you don't have to love Trump. I largely like Trump, but you know I supported DeSantis during the primary. So I'm not like some like MAGA, my God, Trump is the second coming person. I think I think pre-COVID, he was an extremely good president. And then you, it's very hard to judge post-COVID. Hopefully, if he becomes president again, he will have learned some of the mistakes of being rolled by the deep state sort of stuff and paying attention to all those middle management people and everything else, the, the Fauci's, et cetera. Yeah. But, but now the Biden thing is so out of control. What happened on debate night was so profoundly insane. Fauci was, says he had a bad night. Well, Fauci said he had a bad night and then he said maybe he had cold medicine, which then the next morning, Corinne Jean-Pierre said he didn't have cold medicine. Barack Obama said he had a, uh, he had an off night. But, but the thing is, Barack well, Obama Dayquil just- Well, maybe throw his game off. Well, what? Dayquil. Di- <laughs> I don't, I don't think know. Dayquil does I was that. Just, I've been enjoying watching Fauci lie. No, it's just I'm lie after it. lie after yeah. lie after lie. But the reason that, let's say, your mom or people in my family or just the average person out there can never really like acknowledge what happened. First off, I think it would be it's tough to really acknowledge a lot of their behaviors. You know, cutting yes. family members out and not speaking to people. I'm not talking about anyone specific in this instance. Just we all know these types of people. People that unfollowed you, you know, your full of high school friends that unfollowed you and all, all of that nonsense, right? So it's hard to acknowledge that, oh, they were the bad guy in this. People never want to do that. They don't want to take the mirror and be like, damn, you know, I really did go crazy for that time. And it's hard. And people don't like apologizing. You know, so I think that's part of it. I think there's some of that. Well, there's a lot of that. What they, it's not that they have a problem apologizing, although people don't look forward to apologizing, but I don't think it's an inherent problem. My thing is, is they have to admit they were wrong a yeah. lot. And when you admit you fucked up and were wrong a lot, then when the next subject comes down the pike, guess who could be wrong? Yeah. And so what they're trying to do is when they apologize, they're kind of saying they were wrong and they're going to have a lot of certitude about the next thing that they're going to be wrong about. And they're going to do it again. And they're going to do it again. And a nice fat track record of being wrong doesn't help with the next thing you have a ton of certitude about. And the other half were lying. And my theory is, is you don't apologize when you're lying because you know you're lying the whole time. When you're wrong, you apologize because you go, I got it wrong. Sure. But when you're lying to try to get some outcome or effect, then you don't apologize because in your mind, you knew you were lying. Right. So the pe- look, the people that made a mistake or were a little confused or, or just bought the BS that the media was selling to them, you know, those people I would welcome into the wider world as they hopefully wake up and they, uh, as the kids say, they get red pilled and all that. That's great. The liars. Look, if you just did a couple of the things, like the very fine people thing, it is the hoax of hoax of hoaxes. And Biden still slurred it out at the debate. Jake yes. Tapper still pretends it's real. Yes. And literally the next line that Donald Trump said, everyone that's listening to this show knows it already was, I am not talking about the white supremacists or the neo-Nazis who should be condemned completely. So, But they still push that, right? So Jake Tapper knows. Think about if you're Jake Tapper, right? You were doing this debate, you know you're sort of there to run cover for dementia guy and you have to make sure that Trump doesn't do too well, but you can't make it obvious. But it would seem to me that at the very least, if the president of the United States, putting aside the slurring and the confusions and all the times you have to save him from himself, if he just flat out lies on something that has been debunked 
to the nth degree. We have gone to the end of the universe with this thing with the clips, but they still do it. And they yeah. and over, so so I think partly what's happened is the liars that you're talking about, they see no price. There's no penance. There's no there is no there is nothing that they have to pay I, for the lies. And, uh, yeah, and that's I, part of the problem. You know, I think they pay their ultimate price, which is oh. their word and their reputation. Sure. I would I didn't have opinions about these people before the, all the lying, and now I look at them as somewhere between like a prison guard that's been paid off and a, a, a crazy person and really just a person I'd never have to listen and Don King. Right. You know what I mean? Like I just don't <laughs> have to listen to Jake Tapper. And right. when the next Whatever comes down the pike, I'll just have one eyebrow raised, and I'll be going, "Yeah, right." All right, Tell so that's more. that's a fair and, estimation. And it's also, that's... yeah. So you lose in this business. Yeah, your most important commodity is your sort of reputation, and yeah. many people have had that suffered. You know, the one that's even more insane, and I was look, I'm looking at Dawson because we're we're talking about going under the hood before you came in. You didn't hear the bit, but debunking a lot of this stuff. Mm -hmm. So basically, was saying you can find the Hannity. Um, clip where Trump is talking about being a dictator day one. You can find that clip. But I was saying, I was suggesting to my audience that instead of arguing perpetuity over this thing of did he say inject bleach and did he do it like the NBA does it and the NFL does it, go under the hood, look at it, yep. and go, no, he didn't say inject bleach, moving on. You but can't say it anymore. The problem is who's the, who's the trustworthy apparatus to do uh, that? I don't, so, like, who does right. the NFL? Like, I would just would get some, well, I, myself, I would do it. Right. <laughs> they wouldn't believe me, but I'm no, just going. believe you. He, I would, you know what I'd say? I'd go, look, he was yammering extemporaneously about ways to beat COVID. He was kind of referring to the doctor. Like, do you think this has something? He was talking about ultraviolet light. He talked about disinfectant, maybe disinfectant in the lungs or like, oh, he was just kind of pontificating about yeah. stuff. Uh, could you cobble together some version where he said, inject bleach not really you'd have to that's a re, like a strong reach it was someone who was like wondering out loud about remedies and then kept sort of punctuating it with but we'd have to talk to the doctors and see what they thought right so you couldn't interpret it that way even if some of the words were out floating around i just go under the hood i'd look at it two times and i'd pop up and I'd go, that's not what he said you can say he's not a man of science and you can say he was talking about ideas about disinfectant or ultraviolet right but to say he said inject bleach into your arm absolutely not throwing the flag challenge done and no one can bring it up again well you're asking you're asking for something that i would love to have exist but unfortunately there's just no mechanism well, the Hannity, i suppose the the, the one their willful misinterpretation stuff is something that I can never wrap my mind around. And it's, and it's a thing that I find interesting, like, because when you talk about lying or, or things that, things that you find distasteful, let's just say in the news or Biden or anyone, everyone is affected slightly differently. Like for me, in the, the pantheon of, of Biden lies, there's one that doesn't crack anyone's top 20 that's kind of my number one, Which one? bothersome okay. lie. When his wife and kid were killed by the truck driver, he kept saying the guy drank his lunch. And so there's this semi-truck -tr driver, mm -hmm. a diesel truck guy, whose life was ruined because he took two lives in his truck. Yeah. Now, they investigated the accident, and it wasn't his fault. It was unclear did she pull into the intersection, but it wasn't him, and he wasn't drunk. Wow. But every I, actually, time, I didn't even know that. I didn't every know time that. Biden would describe it, he'd go, this guy lost my wife, and I lost my kid, and this guy drank his lunch. And I'm like, this guy has a family, yeah. and he's distraught over killing half your family and you're accusing him of drunk driving, but there's no evidence of that and he wasn't drunk. And then at some point, his daughter said to Biden, could you please stop saying he drank his lunch? My father's a good man. He's very distraught about this whole thing. It's destroyed his life and he wasn't drinking and yeah. you're turning him into a criminal and he kept doing it. And to me, it's like, that makes you a fucking sociopathic, despicable human being. But 
that's not on anyone's top 25. No, I, I truly know? don't even know that story, and I'm pretty good on this stuff. It so, makes you yeah. a bad person. Yeah. It just does. It just does, but that that's what I'm saying. So the fact that they think that Biden, for whatever's left in his brain, thinks he can go up there, not thinks, he knows he can go up there, repeat the very fine people lie, and then know that the moderator is gonna do nothing about it. Right. You wanna, actually I can show you guys a great clip. I think it's the one that you just pulled up almost accidentally, but on Twitter, if you just search my name and very fine people, you can watch me on on uh, real time in with Mar back. It's about eight months ago, and I was on with James Carville, who you you probably had on James Carville on the show, right? Uh -huh. And James Carville, you know, legendary Democratic um, strategist, blah blah blah. And he brought up very fine people, and I debunked it in real time, right in front of in real time on real time, right in front of their faces. And and if we can find the clip, you will see his reaction and Mar's reaction. It's both. It's pretty telling. Watch this. Oh, good. Good people on both sides of Charlottesville. I don't know. Did I hear that or did I make that up? That Trump said there are good people on both sides. He, he didn't say that. He did not. He, he, well, he well, said it, I, but I, a I, sentence I, later, he said, I'm uh, not talking about the white supremacists and, and the oh, neo-Nazis. Oh, well, uh, yeah, I have to. <laughs> <laughs> good people on both sides. <laughs> and so he then just crumbled. He had nothing to say. And then Marr, uh, he cut off a little bit early, but Marr then says, I think we can agree it was inarticulate. Mm -hmm. Which is a hilarious, and I like Bill. I'm seeing Bill tomorrow, so this is not throwing Bill under the bus. But the point is that that the very fine people thing was was the thing that painted Trump as a Nazi. It was the fuel yes. for that. So the idea that now it's three years later, it's been debunked, and all a Democratic strategist has is, <laughs> and then Bill, who is the last sane Democrat, I would say, or the last sane liberal, his answer is, ah, it was just wasn't worded right, but that's not right either. It was actually worded right. He did exactly what we all would have wanted. You condemn the white supremacists and the neo-Nazis. Well, the one that's even more egregious is the dictator day one. Yeah. yeah. Because when you watch it, and we'll we'll play it, it's and you can see if you it find works. the drink, drink is lunch uh, story, which is uh, an interesting one. But either way, or maybe there's tape of him saying that, but... It's so funny because Hannity says to him, look, just debunk the dictator thing before. And Trump can't do anything that anyone tells him to do. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. He won't do it. But if you get that he announced in earnest that he was going to be a dictator day one from this clip. Yeah. Then you are now participating in my favorite game, stupid or liar. It's it can't be. It's one or the other. It's one or the other. There's no third option. I'm assuming liar, but we'll watch the clip. And it's yeah. so abundantly clear what he's saying. But here it is. You are promising America tonight. You would never abuse power as retribution against anybody, except for day one. Except Look, what? He's going crazy. Except for day one. Meaning? I want to close the border and I want to drill. That's drill, not a that's, drill. That's not no, no. that's not retribution. I got I'm it. gonna be I'm gonna be, you know, he keeps we love this guy. He says, You're not gonna be a dictator, are you? I said, no, 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 other than day one. We're closing the border and we're drilling, drilling, drilling. After that I'm not a dictator. So that, okay? that, that sounds to me like you're going back to the yeah, it's such a disingenuous take. And it's also it's joking. I mean, right, look, if joking. that's your take, then you're lying. And, and if that's what you got, that sounds in, insane. Look, the problem, the problem, the problem. And here's the thing: if he was going to do, if he was planning on being a dictator, he wouldn't be yelling at a John Hannity. Yeah, well, also, you don't announce you're going to be a dictator. But really, no. imagine. Okay, so for imagine if what he just said was true. Let's really try to play it out. So it's true what he said. It wasn't a joke. Right. On day one, he's going to close the border. Okay, that doesn't make you a dictator. Right. That makes you someone taking care of the border, which actually is what the president was supposed to do. Uh, what was the second thing? It was close the border Trail. and and dr okay. Dictators, they are always doing more <laughs> with energy. Border security and energy <laughs> security. I, I was half a dictator last night because I got half a tater. Yeah, jeez. I should have brought you another potato. I brought some of it home. Is there a Panera around here? I'll get you a potato. It's not the same. There's no billionaires to eat it with. I could maybe I could find it. Was, it was like I was quick. living in a Grey Poupon commercial. <laughs> Pardon me, sir. Pardon me, sir. Pass the Grey Poupon. I broke my own rule last night and I'm. I got to apologize to you, which is, I took home a doggy bag with steak and what, potato. Yeah, in it. what's the deal?
And, and listen, here's my policy. One. Someone else there took home a doggy uh, bag. Well, I, I don't like Sue doggy Prager bag. took home a doggy bag for dogs. Four dogs. Right. I, and I do believe that. I do, too, because she, yeah. she ate like a veggie patty. Yeah. I took home food for me. And my policy is if I'm paying, I get to take your food. So you, by rights, should have been able to take my food because you paid. Do you think there is a situation in which I would have wanted your leftovers? I'm on vacation here, too. What am I going to do? Bring Adam I Carolla's? I don't know how you oh, celebrate Adam your Carolla has a, <laughs> He has a bite left on his potato, and there's a quarter of a strip steak. I will eat that at 3 a.m. in the hotel room. Do you know? What do you think's going on here? I did sell know, a tech company, man. You know. you know, there's an actual true story where I had Teresa Strauss, a real news girl, and her husband and my wife and at the time and we went, went out to eat for their engagement celebration or something. And I looked at them real straight. And I realized I deliver things in a straight, monotone way, and people tend to believe me. And then so I just looked at him, and I go, look, we're taking you out to dinner tonight. Enjoy. Order everything you want. And dessert and cocktails. Do whatever. It's all on me. But if there's anything left, I take it home. <laughs> and they both just kind of looked at me, you know, like, okay. And I sort of looked at them and nodded. And they're like, all right. And then we got on with the night and uh, cocktails and food and, <laughs> and everything else. And, uh, and the next day, uh, I, I opened the fridge and there was like half a giant pork chop in there or something. And I said to my wife, I said, I'm going to get the pork chop. And she goes, I ordered the pork chop. I took it home and I ate it for lunch. So it's gone. And I go, I'm looking at a pork chop. And she goes, I ate the pork chop. And I go, oh, that's Teresa's pork chop. Oh, oh they took me seriously. They must have had the... And I was I I went to the bathroom or something about, and I took their stuff without knowing it. How was the pork chop? It's fantastic. But what kind of conversation <laughs> must they have had about me driving home from the restaurant? Like he was fucking serious. He took our food. Jeez. <laughs> so that's always been my policy, and I would have been happy to share it with you. No, no, I appreciate generous. that. It's good to know going forward. But I again, I want. I come here, people are depressed here. I want them to eat well, drink well, well enjoy themselves. The yeah. Further quarter of my potato and the rest of my skirt steak. And so for you, Dave, where where do you think everything's heading here? Because on one hand, you know, COVID was a shit show. Everything was a mess. It was weird and depressing getting yelled at, you know, to put a mask on or like telling people to... You know, I was saying open the schools and I was getting yelled at by the LA USD and I was getting yelled at by uh, C-list celebrities, George Takei and uh, Valerie Bertinelli for my stances. Wow, on you were crushing it in 1982. Oh, this is great, great articles. But OK, the point is, is it was very depressing and sad, but it did kind of speed things along yes. in terms of we were like we went from. Oh, I should listen to whatever Rachel Maddow was saying to, oh, I don't have to listen to anything that bitch has. It, it yeah. took like 10 minutes yeah. for that. And, oh, FBI, Deep State, CIA, Fauci, NIA, um, uh, Rochelle Walensky. Like, oh, I don't have to listen. To, oh, oh, I see what's going on. Like, yeah. it took like 10 minutes. Normally, this stuff takes decades. Took 10 minutes. No, they condensed the time on it. And that's why the Biden thing now is so interesting because the lies, uh, the, the, the truth, which is that he is cognitively declined and definitely has either dementia or Parkinson's or some version of one of those or something else, um, they can't lie fast enough now. So lies and the truth are happening at the exact same time. Usually right. it's lies for a while and then the truth is a time release pill that catches right. up. It, I mean, here's what I think is happening right now. I either think... We are in the most dangerous, genuinely the most dangerous spot Americans been in since the Cuban Missile Crisis probably because we have a completely compromised leader, a party in chaos, a lying media, and there are major fires throughout the world. Why, if you were China, why wouldn't you take Taiwan this summer? In, just right. in the next couple, the Why time. wouldn't you just be like, we're doing it because if the US does literally anything, there will be a revolution because this idiot has dementia. Why wouldn't Iran encourage Hezbollah to attack Israel more? Why wouldn't Putin say I can actually take real chance now because if America does anything more, people will say he has to mention all of that stuff. So on one hand, that's a very black pill, bleak picture of how we could be manipulated and all of that stuff. But the, the white pill, which I actually, I hope, I pray, I guess I'm, a, I'm an optimist. I always say I'm a world weary optimist. 
The part that I think is the white pill is what you just said there, that now because so much bullshit has been exposed so repeatedly and the lies now as it relates to Biden are so completely absurd, no one can defend it, that it is possible that this might be the moment where it actually cracks, that we get to this election and if Trump still is there and they haven't put him in jail, which by the way is still an option, they might do that in September, um, if he is still the nominee, or you know, if he's the, the Republican candidate, and if it's Biden or whoever else, but if, if Trump wins and wins decisively, like let's talk Reagan 84 reelection, right? Like a blowout, then enough people will just be like, we are done with all of this. And as Trump said, revenge is not what he needs. Success will be the best revenge. And if it actually happens, we could all just forever turn off MSNBC. We could all shut down the woke idiots. We could ignore all of the Ivy League nonsense. Now, I'm not saying put them in camps. I'm not talking about killing. I am talking just you people no longer deserve to be respected or listened to or anything else. We're not here to kill you, even though you'd love to kill all of us. We are just going to ignore you now and, and build a better world. And I think that is the opportunity. And I'd love to hear Trump try to frame that a little bit. I think he needs to be a little more aspirational as he gets through this now. It's, it can't just be, ah, he's got dementia, you know, I've got work to do. I think there's a way to spin. You want to get past all of this and return to the America that we all knew and loved and all of that stuff. There actually is a way, but the only way and by the way, the left will still go apoplectic and they'll try to burn things down if he's president again and all of that. So I'm not being Pollyannish in that sense. But I think that's the chance. If he crushes it and then it's like, we are done. We are not playing with this nonsense anymore. Yeah, I guess you guys can keep California. And I guess you'll have New York City and some of these other places, but the rest of the world is moving on. And then, and then there will be amazing things on the horizon. You know, Elon's getting us to Mars. There's incredible AI technology being put out now. You probably saw the thing about the paraplegic that can now play chess mm -hmm. through his mind. Like there's so many cool things on the horizon of humanity, but, but not if we're just gonna do this forever. So we, and, and it won't be forever. Right? It feels like we can never get out of it, but nothing is forever. You know, it, it, we're sort of like in the La Brea tar pits right now, and there's a dinosaur and it's sinking and we're kind of stuck with that dinosaur now. And there'll be another dinosaur that jumps on us and we're all going to sink together. Eventually that, that does dry up and then you can get to the other side. So that would be my white pill version of it, but I see no other way around it. If the Democrats win, whether it's Biden or Kamala or a cadaver or whatever, it's a freaking disaster for the country. And I will probably be for Florida secession. Um, Joe, did you find anything about drinking the lunch? Did anyone find uh, that story? Are you looking for it? You're looking for it. Oh, okay. Oh, maybe we have it. Oh, you do have it. Oh, we have it. Yeah? Or no? Oh, I saw something come on the screen. Okay. Yeah. Still looking for the exact quote of him saying it. I know he said it in Delaware and at a university. I'm looking for that video specifically, but this is a, a story explaining the situation and his daughter demanding an apology. Oh, okay. Well, that'll that'll do. Something Dave Rubin doesn't know, everybody. Oh, come on now. <laughs> <laughs> so busy counting potato halves. <laughs> He's missing the big story. <laughs> All right, if you got something, throw it on the... You can put it on my screen. Just a week before Christmas, 1972 the wife of newly elected Senator Joe Biden and their baby daughter were killed and their two sons badly injured when the Biden family car was broadsided by a truck at this intersection in Delaware. The truck driver Curtis Dunn was never charged in the crash, but his daughter Pam Hamill says he too suffered. He grieved over that. He was haunted and tormented by that for years. Dunn died in 1999, but since then, his family has endured widespread rumors and reports that he had been drinking just before the collision. At least twice, Biden himself has made public references to alcohol being involved in the crash. In 2007, Biden said the truck driver, quote, allegedly drank his lunch. And multiple news outlets, including CBS News, have reported that Dunn was drunk. Hamill disputes that, saying her dad had not been drinking. The truth is, it was a tragic accident. No alcohol was involved. The police reports have been lost. But Delaware <laughs> Judge Jerome Hurley, God. who investigated the crash, supports Hamill. He tells CBS News there was no indication that the truck driver had been drinking. Last fall, a spokesman for Biden said Biden fully accepts the Dunn family's word that these rumors were false. Now, Pam Hamill simply wants the record to be cleared. He was a good, hardworking man and a wonderful father. And her father's reputation restored.
Wow. I, I mean, I just did not know. You know how one just gets by and you can't believe it when you, when you hear about it? Like, that fully got by me there. It, the it, records have been lost for, for, <laughs> with the Epstein videos. That's right. <laughs> so for me, there's weird little indicators that don't seem like much to others, but there's sort of that, and then there's him talking about being a Fulbright scholar and being the top of his law class and having three degrees he and all that. He grew up in the black stuff. church and in a reformed temple, uh, that, and he I, was Hispanic. Th- that stuff. He was a midget. That's it's a lot. That stuff's all nuts. But for somehow the record, the academic record, yeah, because everybody waxes a little nostalgic about their past, but it's hard to do with degrees and scholarships and top of your class versus bottom of your class. And it also doesn't need to be set. Like if you're at the right. bottom of your law class, just kind of zip it and just say, I went to law school at Emory or something, but don't, you have to tell it where your ranking was. So that was a crazy telling thing about Biden. That was like sociopath, like kind of had nothing to do with dementia, but grafting on alcohol and booze to a, a guy in a family that's grieving over what happened to a tragedy. Yeah. It, was, it's, uh, it sounds like it was just a tragedy and they investigated it and they didn't bring charges against the guy. So if he was reckless driving or uh, intoxicated or whatever, they would have figured it out. And, and they, they didn't, but to graph that on is, it's like, it's bizarre and it's, it's a little bit evil. Oh, it's not a little evil. It's very evil. Yeah. As far as I can tell, if that report, had any validity there's no evidence of it and the re- records were lost that could make you go down a whole other rabbit hole of who might have been drinking i mean i have no yeah. idea like the re- those records were just i always just, wonder how the records get lost yeah. like the cop put them on top of the, the roof of the car when he filing took the systems up. back then were very efficient we've all seen those systems those draws like it kind of worked i don't know gotta yeah so god that's a weird one, right? Get to Nevada, man. You have to get to Nevada before it's too late. You're right. All right. Well, I got to get back to my half a potato that's calling my name in Malibu right now. Adam, it's your lucky day because I kept one strawberry from the strawberry shortcake. Oh, oh. give it to me. Oh, it's crushed. Oh, damn. Oh. Sue Prager took it home to give her the dog. <laughs> Dave, uh, yes. so much affection. The Dave Rubin, sorry, the Rubin Report, Dave Rubin, um, Go to Ruben Report. Report. Dot. Dot locals. Dot com there you go. for all the info. It's, it's so great to see you, my friend. It's good to see you, man. Say and hi to the other David. Look at you. you you're, still, you're still functioning out here, which is always nice. Because I never know when I come back and I see people and then they don't see, you know, their head's a little crooked or they can't smile exactly or there's a nervousness. But no. you, you seem like it's okay. And you again, know, I apologize for, for confusing your assistant with your girlfriend on that email thread. That was very weird. No problem. Yeah. None taken. And when are you heading back to uh, Florida? Thursday. And Thursday. No, no, no. I'm going to Dallas on Thursday. I'll be back on Friday. I'll come out and visit you, Dave. Come on down. You got man. a guest room? We, we have several guest rooms. I still make the uh, the tomahawk, the Wagyu <sighs> tomahawk. You I'm said Adam Carolla. I'm just saying Adam Carolla said it was the best steak it he ever so had. It was so good. All right, I'll be there.